What I'm talking about is something you probably have never heard a lecture on. I was asked to do this lecture at the Texas Dermatological Society meeting. And I was actually, to be honest, speakers do research. When I did research for the talk, I was actually shocked at what I found. So I think this is a, an important subject that no one ever talks about. And it has nothing to do much with what Dr. Chilakuri talked to you about. That's treating pathologic hyperpigmentation. What I'm talking about is trying to change one's skin tone to lighter, normal, non-pathologic skin tone to lighter. I'm going to be talking about off-label use of things. Skin lightening is a huge business worldwide. It's 84 billion with a B dollars. Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean nations. Uh, I have some studies here listed showing the percentage of individuals, mostly women, who use these skin lightening products. In Africa, skin lighteners, over-the-counter skin lighteners, are the fourth most common purchased household item after soap, tea, and milk. So you would think, with all the emphasis on racial and ethnic pride, that people wouldn't want to be changing their natural skin tone. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, this was a very small pilot study done in New York City, where they very easily found those of African, Afro-Caribbean, Hispanic to a much lesser degree Asian ethnicity who were using over-the-counter skin lightenings. Foreign-born individuals are much more likely to do this. They can bring products into the United States or they're already being imported into the United States. So skin brightening, whitening, lightening, and bleaching, are these all the same? The answer is uh, yes and no. They can be used and are used commercially to all be the same, but skin brightening can really be something like using a, a retinoid just to give the skin a nicer sort of shine and appeal. Skin bleaching can really mean eliminating all melanin. Think Michael Jackson. And then skin lightening and whitening are really what I'm talking about, but in some things that you'll see commercially, these are over-the-counter things, so brightening or bleaching can also be used in the same manner. I want to just give you one example of what I'm talking about. This is, uh, she has passed away, but from complications of diabetes, not from her skin lightening. But this is a famous singer from South Africa, Mishosa. And that's what she looked like when she was a teenage hip-hop star. And that's what she looked like about 16 years later as now a rock star in South Africa. You don't have to be a PhD in rocket science to see that she has changed her skin tone. In fact, she made no bones about it. She did it all the time. She did it since she was a teenager. Does this happen in the US? Well, Sammy Sosa, pictured in the bottom there, was a baseball player, at one point one of the leaders in home run production for the Chicago Cubs. Uh, he uses skin lightening agents every single day. You can look at the dramatic difference in his skin appearance. Little Kim, who's an American rapper, you can see her on the top. Beyonce, one of our biggest stars in the whole country, doesn't admit to using skin lightening products, but if you look at earlier and later pictures of her, unretouched pictures seen on the runway, uh, it kind of looks like she does. And then there have been other individuals who have been implicated, suggested, to be using skin lightening products. Think about this. If you were a 16-year-old black girl and you saw Beyonce with that lighter skin and she's one of your heroes, maybe you'd want to emulate her. And this happens all over the world. This is a long thing. This has been going on for a very long time. Lighter skin meant you didn't work outside. So in ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and medieval Japan, they used various things like white lead shavings to look lighter. 
And then if you think about the colonial era, and I include the antebellum south of the US with that, but also apartheid South Africa, and colonial rule in places like the Philippines, India, the Caribbean nations, and throughout the African continent, with the exception of Ethiopia, who were the rulers? The rulers were the white people, and that meant power and freedom. And so the desire to lighten the skin really became a major force during the colonial era. But even now, there's a process called colorism or shadeism, even in the United States, where those who have lighter skin tones, same racial or ethnic background, but lighter skin tones have advantages in things like education or housing or income or marriage. And you would think, oh, well, that doesn't matter in the United States. But look at this, mean hourly wage in the United States compared dark-skinned African Americans to medium shade African Americans to lighter-skinned African Americans to the average Caucasian respondent. It made a difference. Or how about this? Lighter-skinned Latino men earn $5,000 a year more than darker-skinned Latino men. How about in the justice system of all things? Lighter-skinned black women receive shorter prison sentences in North Carolina. Wouldn't be surprised if it was all over, certainly throughout the South, but it's only been done in one state. Darker-skinned black men are twice as likely to get the death penalty than lighter-skinned black men. This is shadism or colorism, favoritism towards those with lighter skin. And in this survey, it was found that lighter skinned black women marry early and well, emphasis on the well. So the motivation for lightening one's skin is very complex. It's historical in nature and it still persists. In some countries other than the United States, there are very, very influential marketing strategies to promote that. I just grabbed some of these. There are a gazillion of them on the internet, but here's a gentleman from the Sudan in Africa who said, many people say that lighter skin is more popular and more acceptable by your community. Or this woman from Senegal, also in Africa, everybody pays attention to light-skinned girls. This guy from Jamaica, to tell you the truth, everybody wants to bleach out white for the girls. These are recorded in 2020, not 2000, not 1990, but present. This interviewer in the black dress was talking to this girl in India, and these are things her mother told this girl dressed in red there. You are so black you won't ever get a guy. You are so black you won't ever get a job. This woman from South Africa, people are saying when you're dark-skinned you can't find a job, and this woman in the Philippines, yes, I make myself whiter to increase my self-confidence. Does it work? Is this real? Is this true? Well, look at Charlene Pega, who didn't finish high school. She's a 26-year-old Filipina, a beauty and fashion media influencer with over 500,000 followers. Her income, she won't say exactly how much it is, but it's in excess of $1 million. And she attributes her success as a media influencer by lightening her skin and admits to twice daily lightening. If you look at her, she's Filipina. You can tell she has done something to her skin and she admits it. How many of you make a million dollars a year? I certainly don't. And you think, okay, well, these are fly-by-night companies that I've never heard of, and they make strange products in bizarre com countries. Um, Nivea, Pons, Palmolive, Unilever, Neutrogena, L'Oreal, Garnier, you've heard of every single one of those. They're the people, the big companies with big wallop, who are making these kind of products outside the United States but they do filter into the United States. The problem with identifying dangerous products is there are multiple formulations of the same brand. So look at this one, Gore Whitening Cream. It was analyzed in the Philippines. If you look at the label, it says there are certain things in it, but it was found that 100% of over-the-counter sold products by this company of this brand name had mercury in them, 100%. So it was outlawed. You know what happened? A year later, you had Gore Beauty Cream. It's no longer Gore Whitening Cream, 
So it's now legal until it gets banned. Just change the name, why don't you? There are counterfeits, there's lack of any or inaccurate content labeling, and it is incredibly easy to get these kind of products online. I went to four specialty stores in Houston, my home, to cater to Orientals. One is, you can see, Caribbean market, so it caters to those who are darker skinned from the Caribbean, and the other, Beauty Island, caters to those of African background. Every single one of them had shelves, shelves, not one, not a few little products, but shelves worth of over-the-counter skin lightening products, whitening products, bleaching products that were manufactured overseas, brought here, and now being sold in the United States. So this is not just a problem overseas. It's a problem here. And I'll talk about why it's a problem in just a second. It's also being done professionally. This is a big medical practice in the Philippines. There's the leader of the practice, Vicky Bello, and she said in an interview, it's all available online, we use scrubs, lasers, wet and dry derm abrasion, capsules, by mouth, intravenous injections to lighten the skin. Not because of pathology, because people want their skin lighter looking overall because they think it will give them an advantage in all the social spheres. Now, you've seen this here a couple of times, melanin synthesis, key step here is tyrosinase. So most of these lightening compounds available over the skin, over the counter, uh, inhibit tyrosinase. But I want to point out that there's a different pathway where you get pheomelanin instead of eumelanin. That's lighter melanin. That translates to lighter skin. And if you put the substrate of that pathway into the person, that's glutathione, you shift the production of melanin away from darker melanin to lighter melanin, so that's one strategy. And you saw something very much like this from Dr. Chilakuri just a few seconds ago. Most of these lighting, lightening products interfere with tyrosinase. Some are directly toxic to melanocytes. Some interfere with the transfer of melanin from melanocytes to keratinocytes. And those are the major mechanisms of action. The mild lighteners like kojic acid are butanicotinamide, azelaic acid. They're really pretty benign, except for the fact that you can get contact dermatitis. Vitamin C, you've seen mentioned in Dr. Chilakuri's talk, it's a really not very good skin lightener. It's often given intravenously, but in combination with other things to help. It can cause skin and hair to turn yellow. Retinoids, not very much in terms of lightening normal skin tone. They're more effective for pathologic skin pigmentation. But now let's talk about the toxic ones, hydroquinone. Did you know that as part of the CARES Act, that's the Coronavirus Relief Act, September 2020, that hydroquinone 2% over the counter is now banned in the United States, as it is in many other places, like the European Union, Japan, UK, and Australia. Prescription level hydroquinone, 4%, is still allowed, but no more 2% over-the-counter hydroquinone. That got snuck in a coronavirus bill. And the use of hydroquinone over-the-counter was still under investigation when it got into legislation, and that is law now in the United States. What are we concerned about with hydroquinone? Mostly exogenous ochronosis, where you have this pigment that's deposits in the skin that's very difficult to remove. There are some rodent studies that suggest that it's carcinogenic. Those are rodent studies. I don't know about you, I don't see too many rodents. Like, oh, will the next mouse please come in? I just don't see that. But it also can cause uneven pigmentation, loss. This is a guy from Jamaica, a different guy. Look at how he's lightened most of his hand, but right over the knuckles, it hasn't worked. There are plenty of examples of exogenous ochronosis. You can see that at any percentage. It's not just the 12 and 15 and higher percentages that were typically used. They're now banned, but were typically used throughout Africa. But even 2% can do it if you use it long enough. And here are two of my patients. There's a woman from Guatemala who was using an over-the-counter hydroquinone product and a woman from India 
who now have exogenous ochronosis, which is extremely difficult. There's a laser therapy that helps some, but this is really, really difficult. Mercury is the worst of the lot. Most of the mercury containing lightning products, again, I'm reminding you, this is designed to be sold over the counter with no medical supervision whatsoever, are manufactured in the countries I've listed there, sold illegally, illegal, it is illegal to sell them, but you can find it. I found it, mercury containing products in every single one of those stores I went to in Houston, even when it's illegal in the US, EU, UK, Australia, Canada, and many countries in Africa. You can also get it on the internet. And look, at this is amazing. This was a study where they bought products in the United States or in, in Asia. They bought them online or they bought them in stores. One part per million of mercury is considered toxic. 3% of them had mercury over 1,000 parts per million, and some of them, the highest was 45,632 parts, per, 622 parts per million of mercury. One part is considered to be toxic. And how about this? 50% of household contacts of those who are using mercury over-the-counter skin lightening products are found to have toxic levels of mercury in their urine. It's usually mercurous or mercuric chloride, although there are other mercury compounds that are, you can test for the urine. You look for a urine mercury over 20 micrograms per liter. That's toxic and reportable. What can happen? You can have skin eruptions, kidney damage, including the nephrotic syndrome, anxiety, depression, psychosis, insomnia, dementia, seizures, peripheral neuropathy, including tremors, and abnormal taste sensations. And then you have to give chelators forever and a day to get the mercury out of the system, and they themselves are toxic as well. This is from topical mercury. Here are two examples of dyschromia related to using a product that's supposed to lighten your skin. And these are examples in the literature of toxicity from topical mercury products. The latest trend is glutathione because it shifts to the production of lighter, lighter melanin. And this is a natural, it's called the master antioxidant. It's a natural product. The combination of glutamine, glycine, and cysteine, the three amino acids together, it has a lot of biological activity. And actually, in outside the US, it's been used for a few medical indications. This is glutathione. But if you try and increase glutathione to an excessive level, you push the melanin production to lighter melanin. It generally will do that, that's number four, but it can also do some other things to lighten the skin in theory. If you look in the literature, and I did an exhaustive search, there's not much science behind this where actually it's been shown to work. It is not approved for cosmetic use anywhere, anywhere in the world. Oral supplements of glutathione, you're supposed to take 500 milligrams or more a day. So I'm an Amazon Prime member, so I went on Amazon Prime. Plenty of glutathione, no problem. You can buy it over the counter, no regulation. But this is what's really amazing. IV glutathione is available, including kits, over the counter. Sometimes this is done, IV infusions by healthcare professionals or moonlighting nurses or individuals who are doing this based upon getting an IV instruction on YouTube. And you can get the kit and the glutathione online to give yourself an IV glutathione drip to lighten your skin. What can happen? Renal failure and hepatic injury are the worst. It can be contaminated with other things. Go online. Get yourself some IV glutathione. This company is headquartered in Houston. Notice, this is their web Notice how it's misleading. You see that FDA? That's like you think, oh, well, this must be FDA approved. It isn't FDA approved for use, for medical purposes in the US, for anything. But they have FDA. What they're saying is they're an FDA approved compounding pharmacy. That's what they're saying. Very misleading. And you have endotoxin poisoning from contaminated IV glutathione. And this is my favorite slide in this whole talk. This woman has a beautiful YouTube video. I'm going to show you how I self-inject glutathione 
And then she lists all the places you can get it online, including an IV infusion set that you do yourself. And she wraps her arm and she shows you how one person can give their own IV glutathione. Okay, that's cool. Steroids may lighten the skin probably by interfering with tyrosinase, but what's in the products when they've been analyzed over the counter, off the shelf, taken out of a commercial, either a flea market or a store, it's clobetazole for the most part. And you all know what can happen if you're using clobetazole on a regular basis. Stria, acne, atrophy, profuse tinea, hypertrichosis, and yes, all the way up to adrenal suppression and Cushing's disease, all from topical skin lightening products that have steroids in them that may or may not be labeled as such. And that's the big problem. You see the two pictures from an article in the JAD, and that's my patient with the blue top using a skin lightening product containing clobetazole that was not labeled as such. I had it analyzed at a biochem place, and it had clobetazole in it. And look at what's happened to her. I can't fix that. Over-the-counter, unregulated skin lightening products. This is from the Indian literature, hypertrichosis and acne. So here's my conclusion. Skin lightening is an ancient tradition. It goes back, it persists today. The efforts to lighten the skin are global. It is not outside the United States. It is in the United States. Not always from people from outside the United States who have come here. They may bring that and then their friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbors may use these products. The motivation is complex and has to do with power, money, status, and sex. Shadism is a modern hangover from colonialism. Various topical oral and IV agents I've tried in the small amount of time given me to share some of those with you are variably effective, but they have cutaneous as well as systemic risks. Kidney, hepatic injury, neurologic damage, and then all the baggage that you get with topical potent steroids. The latest craze is IV injection of an unapproved material, easily obtainable online. And for many products, you can't even tell what's in them because their labeling is inaccurate or inadequate. And I say that what we need is socially sensitive. You can't look at your patients and say, you shouldn't be using that crap. No, you have to be sensitive to the reason why someone's doing this, and you have to explain rationally what risks they're taking. I hope in this brief presentation, I've motivated you to think about this as a serious risk. Thank you very much.